Burt Bell was the commissioner of professional football. He organized the National Football League. And he was a character, too. He worked out of a little office in an athletic club in Philadelphia. And we decided that we wanted to carry uh, as many teams as we could buy uh, in the National Football League. And I think there were 12 of them in the league at that time. They're three times that number now. And we found out that the man we had to talk to was Bert Bell, who was the commissioner, who was succeeded later by Pete Rosell, and I don't know who the commissioner is now, but they were all together. Anyway, I went down to Philadelphia and I met with Bell in his little office in the athletic club down there. And he had a big board on the wall in which he had all the teams, the 12 teams, and all the games uh, charted out on the board. And we struck a deal where we could buy the rights. Oh, he couldn't sell us the rights because it would be antitrust. We had to buy the rights from each individual team. So we bought the rights to 10 teams with his blessing um, for a million dollars for 10 teams. You couldn't buy one game with one team today for a million dollars. We bought 10 teams, their full schedule. But there was a basic problem in the fact that a number of these teams had local sponsors. For instance, the Philadelphia team had sold Philadelphia to Atlantic Refining. The Cleveland Browns had sold their home, their, their games to Carling's Brewery. And this was the case in a number of cities throughout the country. Now, they could only when they sold those games, they, they were, were seen only in the city of the team. So we had to, if we were carrying a Cleveland Browns game from Los Angeles, the Ram, playing the Rams, we couldn't take it into Cleveland because Carlings had the sponsorship rights in Cleveland or we couldn't take the Philadelphia team uh, into Philadelphia when, if we were picking it up, say, in St. Louis. So we had to black out Philadelphia so that the Atlantic Refining sponsorship could run in Philadelphia. And this was the case all over the country, but yet every uh, Sunday, and on Saturday nights, which we created, they had never played on Saturday nights, but for purposes of scheduling, we asked them to put their, some of their games on Saturday night so that we could feed the entire network uh, on Saturday night and then feed again another game on Sunday. And this went on for a couple of years. So you had to work the schedule so the Saturday and the Sunday games didn't have that conflict with sponsors? Yes. We had to black out in many cities. Uh, we had, for instance, we had to black out Cleveland if they were playing on Saturday night. But on Sunday, we could put another game into Cleveland so we could uh, sell a sponsor national coverage between Saturday night and Sunday. It was very complicated and required a great deal of uh, engineering from the point of view of cable and uh, getting each game into each city that it was supposed to go into. The league did work with you with this. They didn't, oh, very much so. Didn't care. Yes, Bert Bell agreed to this, and he worked the schedule so it would mesh with what we needed uh, to sell a national sponsor. 
and we sold it to Westinghouse. They bought national sponsorship of professional football. First time it was ever done. And uh, it was very successful. As a matter of fact, right after the season ended, they renewed for a second season. And uh, about oh, a month after they renewed, I got a phone call from their agency in Pittsburgh, Ketcher, McLeod, and Grove, saying, uh, we made a mistake. Uh, Westinghouse uh, doesn't want to sponsor football again in the fall. And I said, you're kidding, aren't you? He said, no, we're serious. We want, we want you to relieve us of the order. And at this time, the, the rights figure that we had had gone up by 200,000. So I, I had picked up the 10 teams for a million two for the following season. And I thought about this for a while. And General Motors had been calling regularly to buy professional football from us. And I had to turn them down because of the Westinghouse uh, sponsorship. So knowing that General Motors wanted it, I very foolishly said to the Westinghouse agency, okay, fellas, you're off the hook. Figuring I was gonna go to Detroit and sign General Motors, which I, I went to Detroit call the General Motors vice president in charge of advertising, who had been calling me for sponsorship, and said, I'm coming out to see you, and we made a date. And I got out there, and he said, well, now explain to me how this works. And I explained the Saturday-Sunday arrangement and how cities were blacked out with the home teams and so on. And he looked at me, and he said, your ship has barnacles on it, and General Motors doesn't buy anything with barnacles on it. And I was dismissed. And I almost died. Here I'm sitting with a million two hundred thousand dollars committed for rights, and I didn't have a sponsor. And I had let Westinghouse off the hook. Well, I went back and I told my sad story to Dr. Dumont. He said, do the best you can with it. So what we did, we co-opted that second season. We sent the games to all the affiliates who wanted it, and they could sell it locally in their city and pay us uh, a fee so that we could recover some money against the rights that we had to pay. We never got our cable costs out of it, but we got some rights money back. Was there still a loss on your part? Oh, it was a big loss. We lost, well, not only the Westinghouse sponsorship, which would have paid for our time and our rights. Uh, I imagine it cost us a couple of million dollars to uh, feed it to all the stations.